أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين Respected viewers, Salaamun Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Indeed, it is from the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are blessed tonight to be within the precincts of the pure haram of Imam al-Askari, Imam Ali ibn Muhammad al-Hadi, and Imam Hassan ibn Ali al-Askari, salawatullahi alayhi ma ajma'een. It is within this divine haram uh, located in the city of Samarra, that we gather here tonight to discuss and to shed light on a few aspects of the life of both these great divinely appointed Imams. Imam Ali ibn Muhammad al-Hadi wa Imam Hassan ibn Ali al-Askari. Peace be upon them both. When we analyze and we contemplate and we study the life of Imam Ali ibn Muhammad al-Hadi, Historians mention to us that Imam al-Hadi was born in, this, in a town called Saria within the outskirts of Medina. This was in essence a town that was established by his grandfather, Imam Musa ibn Jafar al-Kadim, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. This uh, town later on developed and this is where Imam al-Hadi was born. Historians narrate that he undertook the divine responsibility of Imama at the tender age of eight. And you find that this is a phenomenon that was shared by his father, Imam Muhammad al-Jawad, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, who also took, undertook the responsibility of Imama at the tender age of seven. The fact that these, both these Imams undertook their responsibility of divine leadership at such a tender age in itself is one of the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is proof of the superiority of the madhab of Ahlul Bayt over any other sect and any other religion that exists. For indeed, for such a person who seemingly outwardly seems to be a child at the age of eight, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed within him the knowledge of all the Anbiya from Adam until Khatam, the most knowledgeable person on earth at the age of eight. This phenomenon in itself served as a sign that or this phenomenon in itself represents the fact that Imam Ali ibn Muhammad al-Hadi alayhi salam was an ayah from the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a sign of from the very many signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leading mankind towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the narrations or the historians mention that Imam al-Hadi undertook the responsibility of Imamat at the age of eight. Upon the martyrdom of his father, Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Hadi returned back to the city of his grandfather, the city of Medina al-Munawwara in the land of Hijaz. He spent the first approximately 20 years of his life in Medina. And as you can imagine, at the age of eight, as he would disseminate ilm, knowledge about the laws of the Sharia, about the laws of Islam, and he would talk about the history of the Holy Prophet and share the narrations of the Holy Prophet, explaining them, expanding upon them in the right manner. He became a center of attraction in that the people would gravitate towards Imam al-Hadi for ilm. They would come to Imam al-Hadi seeking intercession from him, seeking for their desires and their supplications to be accepted. And this is no point of amazement and definitely does not Co constitute of shirk as many other deviant sects may believe. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has selected certain individuals through them our prayers are accepted. Through them our for we are able to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the intermediaries between us and the Lord of the universe as is mentioned within the Quran Bismillah ar-Rahman ar rahim Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, have taqwa. Fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have fear of the day of judgment. Fear the consequence of your actions. And seek a wasila. Seek an intermediary towards him. That these intermediaries are none other than Rasulullah and his household, the Ahlul Bayt, due to the divine purity 
which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ascertained for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Innama yuridu Allahu li yudhiba ankum ar-ridsha ahla al-bayt wa yutahhirakum tathira. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And as per ittifaq from the ulama of the amma and the khasa, this verse was revealed on the Rasulullah while he was under the kisa together with Amir al-Mu'mineen, Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, Imam Hassan and Imam al-Hussein. And by extension, it includes the nine imams from the lineage of Imam al-Hussein, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. When we look into this history of Imam al-Hadi and we notice and we come to the understanding that he was a center of attraction in the city of Medina, this now began to catch the eye of the tyrants and the dictatorial regime of Bani Abbas whose leadership, whose capital was based in the city of Baghdad which they later on moved to the city of Samarra. Samarra in itself was a military garrison, a massive military base you could think about it as a military base which encompassed a city, an entire city in itself. Therefore, it was a military base that comprised of a city and the capital of the Bani Abbas regime was moved to the city of Samarra. So it is over here that the governor of Medina and the governor of Mecca who were secretly observing and keeping a watch on the activities of Imam al-Hadi when they began to realize and recognize the strength and of the, uh, the strength within the numbers of the people who followed Imam al-Hadi, the popularity that he commanded from amongst the citizens of the state, this was a point of fear for them and they had observations and they had reservations in regards to this. As you know, with every dictatorial regime, they are not able to handle and they are not able to bear the fact that there would be one other individual within their government who the people have love, respect and look at him from an angle of authority. This is Bani Abbas who had established leadership on earth on the false premise that they were the, so, that they were the divinely appointed Khulafa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore when the real Khalif of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unveils himself and the people naturally gravitate towards him, they see this as a point of threat. In any case, the governor of Medina writes a letter to the Khalif of Bani Abbas stating to him the activities of Imam al-Hadi and how he was gaining popular support from amongst the masses. And the governor goes on to say to the Khalif that if the Khalif at that time being mutawakkil, la'anatullahi alayhi, that if you have any need for the land of Hijaz, ya'ani, if you want to protect the land of Hijaz from any form of revolution or any form of rebellion against your government, then it is imperative for you to remove Imam al-Hadi from the lands of Medina. This letter reached Mutawakkil. Mutawakkil then called for Imam al-Hadi to be moved from Medina and be brought to the city of Samarra. You find that this was a tactic of deceit in that he wrote a letter inviting Imam al-Hadi pretending to be respectful towards him and acknowledging his position and to invite him as a dignitary and as a guest to Samarra. This was a story that was sold towards the public. However, within this there was deceit and there was nothing less than pure animosity for when they called Imam al-Hadi to the land of Samarra, he was brought against his wishes and as soon as he came into the land of Samarra, he was forced, and he was forced under house arrest, imprisoned within his own house. In addition to the fact for the time that he spent in Samarra, he was moved in a number of prisons. In fact, uh, not far from the haram of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, perhaps three or four kilometers from the haram, there is uh, still traces of the Tamura, Tamura which is an underground prison that was dug uh, seven to ten feet perhaps underneath the earth in which Imam al-Hadi was imprisoned. So you find that under these extreme situations, he was basically brought into Samarra such that the government may be able to keep an eye on him, such that they may disconnect him and make him aloof from the entire public. His access to the public was to be highly limited. Imam al-Hadi was brought into the city of Samarra and kept under house imprisonment and tight government watch and control until the end of his life where he was eventually poisoned. You find that the life and times of Imam al-Hadi were absolutely challenging. 
for him and for the Shias in particular. The ruler of Bani Abbas by the name of Mutawakkil in particular was a bloodthirsty person who ruled heartlessly and executed thousands of Shias, followers and lovers of Ahlul Bayt for the time that he was there in power. He was not able to stand any person who had any form of affiliation, love or loyalty towards Amir al and towards the Ahlul Bayt. You find, for example, from the many massacres and many executions that take, took place of the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, one that definitely stood out was the execution of one of the followers of Imam al-Hadi by the name of Ibn Sikit. Ibn Sikit was a companion of Imam al-Hadi and a companion of Imam al-Jawad, a highly educated person who was an expert, a leading expert, you could say, in the fields of uh, Arabic grammar and Arabic language and poetry and literature. He was from one of the companions of Imam al-Jawad and Imam al-Hadi. He was employed to teach the two children of Mutawakkil Arabic grammar and literature. And not out of will but out of to a certain extent from out of to a certain extent due to taqiyya ibn shikit accepted the position and the responsibility of teaching the children of mutawakkil arabic grammar and language and when you find that scholars and when you find followers of high caliber like those of ibn shikit when they accept to take positions like this it is not because they're showing any sort of servitude towards the government of that time the tyrant government of that time balke it could have been rather it could have been within the intentions and within the vision and the strategy of ibn shikit that through this position of teaching grammar and literature to the children of mutawakkil he would perhaps be able to influence them towards the path of of Ahlul Bayt. In any case, one day as Ibn Sikit is teaching the two children, Mutawakkil calls him. He summons him to the court. And this is because of the rumors that were spreading around in regards to Ibn Sikit's affiliation to Imam Al Hadi. So Mutawakkil wanted to test Ibn Sikit to see whether he truly adheres to this sect or no. They summon him to the court. And as they summon him to the court, Mutawakkil asks him a question Ibn Sikit. Who is more honorable in your eyes? My two sons, yani the ones whom he was teaching, my two sons or the two sons of Ali ibn Abi Talib, yani Hassan and Hussein. Who is more honorable? Who is more elite? Who is more exalted, if you may say? Ibn Sikit was filled with anger and his blood was boiling. Anger in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was not able to contain his sentiments that anyone, particularly from Bani Abbas, the likes of Mutawakkil, who are known for their fisk and their fasad and their ungodliness, to even think about comparing their children to the two children of Amir al Mu'minin, Sayyid al Shabab, Ahl al Jannah. For Ibn Sikit was not able to control his anger and he says out to Mutawakkil with full confidence and with full courage, he says to them that, How dare you ask me? about the two sons in regards to Hassan and Hussein. I find that even Kambar, the slave of Amir al the servant of Amir al to be better than your two sons. And this answer struck Mutawakkil like thunder from the skies. And he was not able to bear this answer. So he commanded his guards to take Ibn Sikit and to pull out his tongue. The historians mentioned that they pulled out his tongue and in another tradition or in another version of history, it mentions that in addition to pulling out his tongue, he had his guards stab Ibn Sikit in the stomach to death. This is the way Mutawakkil dealt with the Shias of Amir al muminin and the Shias of Imam al-Hadi. These are the circumstances under which Imam al-Hadi lived. We also have that during the period of Mutawakkil, the time in which Imam al-Hadi conducted the responsibilities of Imama, Mutawakkil destroyed out of his hatred for Imam Amir al muminin and his hatred for Ahlul Bayt, he destroyed the shrine of Sayyid al-Shuhada in Karbala 17 times. 17 times the Haram of Imam al Hussein was raised down to the ground. One of these times, the entire city of Karbala, the, the area around the Hadara, the grave of Imam al Hussein, the entire area was raised down and the entire area was flooded. Another time when they destroyed the Haram of Sayyid al Shuhada in Karbala, 
the historians mention that two bulls or ox were brought such that they may plow the land over the grave of Imam al Hussein, making sure that a not a single trace of the grave of Imam al Hussein would remain. Why? You find that prior to Imam al Hadi, Imam al Baqir and Imam al Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhima, there were hundreds of traditions encouraging the Shia to visit, to perform the ziyara of Imam al Hussein. The importance and the thawab of crying for Imam al Hussein for reviving the tragedy of Karbala. Then on this end, you find that Mutawakkil commands that the entire haram of Sayyidah Shuhada be raised, not once but 17 times. Why? Because of the power that the revolution of Imam al Hussein wields in itself. This commemoration of the Azar of Sayyidah Shuhada, getting together, bringing, reviving his memory, reviving the manner in which he was persecuted, the manner in which he was killed on the day of Ashura together with his family members. This in itself wells within it a spiritual power. It creates within the masses this fervor and this sense of revolution to stand up against dhulm, to stand up and protect the rights of Ahlul Bayt. And Mutawakkil understood the potential of the, uh, the potential that lies within reviving the dhikr of Ahlul Bayt and in particular the dhikr of Sayyidah Shuhada. He understood the power that is represented within the institution of Ziyara, which is why he commanded the entire haram of Imam al Hussein, the grave of Imam al Hussein, to be destroyed 17 times during his rulership. Not only that, in addition to all this, the people who would travel from different parts of the Islamic land to perform the ziyara of Sayyidah Shuhada during the time of Mutawakkil, his guards used to tax the Zawar. They would have to pay high amounts of money. Many times they would have to sell their houses just in order to go and pay tribute to the grave of Imam al Hussein, which they did happily. When Mutawakkil saw that all the financial penalties is not serving its purpose in terms of being a hindrance to edge the ziyara, Mutawakkil used to command his guards that any person who is caught or any person who is seen visiting Imam al Hussein, one of his limbs should be severed. So therefore, people who would go for ziyara, when they were stopped, you could say at checkpoints by the army or by the guards, by the military, their arms would be severed. You'd find a person who goes for ziyara the first year, his right arm is severed. His right arm is severed as a tax to go for ziyara. You find another time, the same person goes for ziyara again, his right hand is amputated, he would give his left hand in amputation. And therefore you see that when you study the life of Imam al-Hadi, the difficulties, the trials and the tribulations that, uh, uh, that were rampant during that time is one that is unmatched perhaps in any other part of history. And this in itself should serve as a reminder to you and I the expense and the difficulty through which we have been able to receive our religion today. All this happening during the time of Imam al-Hadi. The historians also mention that it is during the time of Imam al-Hadi that the likes of Mutawakkil promoted sectarianism during their rule. Yani it was during the time of Mutawakkil that he promoted sectarianism within the Islamic Ummah. And this is through the funding and the establishment of vegan sects that would then be a form of, if you could say, competition towards Imam al-Hadi. Imam al-Hadi was recognized as the sole Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth and that Tashayyu represented the true Islam through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped in the way that he willed. It is through the Ahlul Bayt that the Quran is understood and interpreted in the right way, free of any distortions. So Mutawakkil and the likes of Mutawakkil, they began to create sects that would then compete in terms of authority against Imam al-Hadi. And through this, many people were not only, many people were deviated away from Imam al-Hadi. And chaos was prevalent within the Islamic Ummah. You find that from many of the deviant sects that were formed during the time of Imam al-Hadi, one of them was the sect of the Ghulat, 
they were rampant, they existed even before the time of Imam al-Hadi. But during every age, during every period, this sect of the Ghulat was revived and a personality as the head of the sect would emanate, would arise to cause confusion. Not only draw people away from Imam al-Hadi in terms of a competing sect, if you may say, but at the same time to create confusion within the circles of the Shia. You find that one such individual was Ali ibn Hasaka. Ali ibn Hasaka was from the Ghulat. The Ghulat, by the way, those who are guilty of the crime of Ghulu. This was a sect that was formed by the enemies of Ahlul Bayt, as is attested to by Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. You notice that the Ghulu are those people who are the Ghulat. The Ghulat are those who attribute lordship to Allah, to the Ahlul Bayt. Yani they claim that Ahlul Bayt in themselves are reincarnations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They claim that the Ahlul Bayt are the manifestation of the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an important definition for us to understand. Unlike a definition which is prevalent today that anybody who speaks about the exalted merits of Ahlul Bayt, the fada'il of Ahlul Bayt, the fact that they have ilmul ghaib, the fact that they are able to perform miracles, the fact that the power of kun fayakun is granted to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This does not constitute ghulu. Ghulu is to attest rububiyah to them and there is a very fine difference in regards to this and a very clear difference the likes of Ali bin Hasaka they would come around and they would preach to the people that Imam al-Hadi in essence is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is a reincarnation of the God and that he himself Ali bin Hasaka is the representative of Imam al-Hadi and you find that it is ideas such as these where they were propagated, funded by the likes of Mutawakkil, such that people would deviate from the following of Imam al-Hadi on one side, and on the other side, the wider Islamic uh, Ummah would look at Imam al-Hadi and they would have hatred in their hearts for Imam al-Hadi because of the likes of the teachings of Ali ibn Hasaka. Taban, without doubt, Imam al-Hadi had nothing to do with this, and he issued a number of statements condemning Ali ibn Hasaka and educating the Shia through his wukala to stay away from the likes of Ali ibn Hasaka. In fact, we have that uh, from one of the companions of Imam al-Hadi, there was a companion known as Fadl ibn Shadan. During his life, he authored 180 books of hadith. And from these 180 books, one of his books or a couple of his books was clearing and answering back to the shubuhat or to the false ideologies preached by Ali ibn Hasaka. From amongst the other trials and tribulations that Imam al-Hadi saw within his life was the establishment of these false sects.